Hey everyone, Pastor Bill Wiggs here from the Sunfield and Greenwood United Methodist Churches in Southern Illinois with a devotional for Monday, October the 12th, 2020. We are working our way through Paul's first epistle or letter to Timothy. This is the first of the three pastoral epistles of the Apostle Paul to pastors in local churches. This letter has been written to Timothy, Paul's partner in the faith, one who has been on missionary journeys with him, who he has now left in charge of the Ephesus church, Paul serving as their bishop and Timothy serving as the elder in that place. And there are some problems in the church, as there seems to be throughout all of the letters that are written by any of the apostles to the churches, there seem to be some problems that they are trying to deal with. It may be doctrinal in nature, it may, you know, may have to do with their theology, it may have to do with relationships in the church, but whatever it is, the apostle trying to do his duty as a bishop, after all, bishops are intended not just as administrators, but to be the defenders of the faith those who make sure that the pastors are delivering the faith once given to the saints. And so he is dealing with that in many of his letters, but this one is specifically to encourage Timothy to do the job for which he was appointed as elder in charge of the church at Ephesus. And what he is supposed to be doing is straightening out a big mess. Well, I invite you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 in your Bibles or another electronic device if you have a second one there. And we're going to be looking today at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. I have several Bibles in front of me here. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And it says this, We know that the law is good when used correctly, for the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. This is the word of the Lord for his people today, and let us rejoice and be thankful for all God has done for us, is doing, and will do. As we look at this text, we find a, a really curious thing happening here. There is part of the church in that day, and I would say in this day too, that is very law-centered. You know, the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots, to use the King James vernacular of it all. And a lot of churches are definitely based on, and a lot of religious groups are based on, following the rules. Whatever the rules are, are they biblical rules, such as the Ten Commandments or other laws within the Scripture? Or are they man-made rules interpreting what the Scripture has to say or railing against something that they don't particularly like? When I was growing up, I went to a private Christian school. It was in, from an independent, fundamental Bible Churches of America type church, and we used the uh, ACE curriculum, and we had an awful lot of rules in the school. They wanted us to sign every year, have our parents sign a paper that said we wouldn't listen to rock music. Uh, I always thought that was kind of funny, as if rock music was the only impure music in the world, but they thought rock music was somehow really bad. Uh, in that church, which I attended for a very short time, not much time did I attend that church, just once in a while, uh, they taught that dancing was in itself evil and led to sex, you know. Uh, they had all kinds of rules. We had a six-inch rule. You had to stay six inches away from the opposite sex. And then later it became a no contact rule. Don't touch anybody, because touching anybody could lead to impure thoughts. Uh, so that's kind of a, the way they operated. There were lots and lots of rules and almost no grace whatsoever. 
And so what Paul says to Timothy is something that he's trying to get the whole church to understand is that if we are living according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, then we don't need to worry about the laws, not that the law of God should be set aside, but we don't need to worry about the laws because we will live for God, and then it will become naturally. God's law will be written on our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. And so he says, we know that the law is good when used correctly, or if we use it lawfully. In other words, God's law is good. His law is absolutely good. God wrote his law to show us what he expected of us and to help human society survive and thrive. If you look at the Ten Commandments especially, you will see that they have to do with relationship with God and relationship with other human beings. And because of that, they are meant for a society that is fully surrendered to God. However, they are written to a society that has trouble with being surrendered to God. And so if the law is used correctly, then it is used as a guiding force in your life. It's not used to beat up on others. It's not used as a way of getting people to submit to your will. It is, if used correctly, it is used by the people of God, submitted to the will of God for the good of all those who believe in God and, in fact, for the good of the whole world. Here's some of the things that he goes on to say then. For the law was not intended for people who do what is right. Why? Because you wouldn't need the law if by nature you did what was right. But we have a sin nature within us because of the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and their disobedience to God. Sin entered the world because of the first sin when Adam and Eve chose by their own free will to disobey God and to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The law is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred, who defile what is holy. If we look at our culture today and many cultures around the world, we will see that the world is defiling everything that is holy. The world is taking some of God's most beautiful gifts and turning it into something truly ugly and putrid in his sight. We see where they dress up little bitty girls as prostitutes these days, where little boys are in drag shows, where little girls are performing dances that grown women should not be doing. You take the most pure thing you have, the child, and then you pollute it with a sin culture that sexualizes everything. That's what's going on in our world today, and it is nothing new. Oh, it comes up in different forms, but it still is the same old thing. You take marriage today, and you make it just a contract that can be easily broken for as long as we both shall love, instead of the beauty of the fact that it is a one flesh relationship bound together by God, one man, one woman for life in the covenant of marriage with God as the binding force. You pollute that with adultery and fornication. I know you're going to say, uh-oh, he's using those, uh, those old-timey words. Fornication is simply sex outside of the bonds of one man and one woman for life in the commitment and covenant of marriage. So any sexual activity whatsoever outside of that is considered fornication or adultery. If you're married, it's adultery. And what it really is, is it is putting the creature, the person, the physical desires above the God who made us and above everything else. And so he goes on to list some of the problems. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders. You know, that, that's in there too. I, I want to just take a note of that real quick because... There are people who will try to say that the Bible condones slavery, and in fact, during the slave times in the United States of America and throughout the world, 
in communities that were primarily Christian, they would try to use the Bible to say that owning slaves was a God-ordained thing. But the Apostle Paul writes right here, these are the lawless ones. These are the ones who pollute. So slavery, so if that's your hang-up right now, and we've got a lot of stuff going on about racial justice, it's a sin. It was a sin back then. It's a sin now. It's always been a sin. And the Bible speaks to it. So the law is for people who are sexually immoral, who practice homosexuality, who are slave traders, who are liars. Yeah, <laughs> who are liars. Be careful now. Promise breakers. Wow, that's an amazing one. You ever broke a promise? I know I have. Well, the law of God calls us to honesty, to honestly keep our commitments or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. The law is there for the lawbreaker, for the one who lives their life after the pattern of Christ, for the one who lives their life in the law of love, for the one who understands that all life is sacred from the very moment of conception all the way until our natural death. We do not need to worry about the law because the law is written on our hearts. But if we all were to be really honest with ourselves, honest with our brothers and sisters in Christ, honest with our God, we would know that all of us stumble and fall. All of us fail, from time to time at least, to live up to the glory of God. And therefore, God's law is there in order to keep us on the right track. It is the rails uh, that keep the train of righteousness going in the right direction. And so we need his law. We need his law until he perfects in us his love and writes his word deeply on our hearts. We need his Holy Spirit to guide us so that we can live lives in the beauty of holiness. We're going to fail from time to time, but his law is there to keep us on track. His law is there to show us what he expects of us. And if we will live according to his law, and if we will surrender ourselves fully to him, then his Holy Spirit will work in us to bring us to entire sanctification, that perfection in his love, so that we may fully live for him. And when we are living for him, the light of Christ will shine forth from our hearts into all those around us, and we will have great opportunity to share the good news. But even when we stumble, even when we fall, the law is there to show us the way back home to God. So let us trust in him more fully today. Let us experience the power of his love. Let us commit ourselves to live for the glorious good news and to live in the light of it, that it will not just be a theology we believe, but instead the glorious good news of Jesus Christ will be our very life, the driving force of who we are. And if we allow that, God will use us then to reach others who need to know him. Let us commit today to live in the beauty of his holiness, that we might bring glory and honor to him, and that all the world might know that we have a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you and praise you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for your glorious good news. We thank you for your law, Father, that teaches us what it is that you expect of us and gives us the guidelines, the tracks on which our righteousness rides. Lord, we thank you for all of that. For those times when we have been lawbreakers, when we have treated what is holy as profane, we do truly repent. And we ask, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would wash those sins away. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would guide us each and every day to live into the beauty of holiness and that you would guide us even more that we might be able to share your good news, Jesus, to all the world, so that many more will come to know you. Be with the sick today. Be with those who struggle today. Show forth your glory in our lives that many more might come to know you. For we pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 
Well, until tomorrow, my brothers and sisters in Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, and may he give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You have a great rest of the day. God is faithful, forever God is strong.